Start recording. Okay. Good morning and welcome to this advanced style session today. We are going to be covering quite a lot today. We're going to be looking at the ggplot2 package, distribution fitting, and building apps in Shiny. So I hope you're ready for this. Um, we have got... So we're going to start with a short introduction to the day and then get into advanced plotting with ggplot, distribution fitting with fitdistr plus and web app development with Shiny. So basically ggplot2 um, is a package, uh, the prime, uh, primo um, graph building package in R and it allows you to build pretty much uh, any graph that you can think of. Then we're going to work through distribution fitting. And this is where, um, as you'll have probably come across already in the other sessions, we use a lot of distributions uh, to be able to um, replicate the variability in our data and use these for various different modeling applications. This gives us the stochast uh, stochasticity uh, within our models, the variability. And so we're going to look at how we do distribution fitting with R. And then we're going to look at building web apps with Shiny, because these are really handy. Uh, these are great ways to be able to build little tools um, or dashboards that you can use either just individually or distribute to your colleagues. Um, and you know, it's a great way to package up uh, useful little tools that you've developed and ways of doing things that you've come across. And in this instance, we're going to end up building a distribution fitting app that you'll be able to um, use and extend for your own purposes uh, as you go through with various different projects in the future. So we start, start with the introduction. I don't think it's going to take half an hour, but we'll start with that. And then we're going to go through plotting as an exercise after that. We'll have a little break about 11 o'clock. Um, then get into working with distributions. Then we've got an exercise um, around fitting distributions. Lunch half 12 to half one. Then into using Shiny bit of a comfort break in the afternoon. And then the final, let's build this distribution fitting app exercise. And we'll come back at the end just for a bit of discussion around how that went. <laughs> so, right, on the uh, GitHub repository, there are all of the resources for this session. I hope you've uh, been able to download them. And this is uh, the presentation, all that is split into folders by distribution fitting, ggplot and uh, shiny. And so I hope you've got all the code and everything that was and all the different folders in uh, that were in there, as there's quite a lot of examples, um, particularly for the R shiny one as they have to be contained as separate apps. So there's a lot of separate folders there. Um, there's also some extra bits uh, around resources, which are uh, useful, helpful resources, which are contained within this presentation, and also in some extra um, documents, particularly for ggplot. So let's dive straight in. Um, first, well, actually, before we dive straight in, um, has everybody installed the four packages that I mentioned uh, for today? So there are ggplot2, fitdistr plus, shiny, and actuar are the four packages that need to be installed for today. If you haven't installed them, you can either go through and do that manually within, um, within the uh, uh, sorry, within our, uh, our studio itself, 
or you can use the line install.packages, open brackets C, and then the names of the uh, packages that we're going to be using. Um, and that information you'll find in the GitHub repo in the session 4B folder. OK. ggplot2. What's so special about this? Well, it's an incredibly powerful plotting library. Um, it is complex, but it's very, very flexible. It allows you to build up plots in different layers and present them in different formats and transform them um, using relatively simple commands. Um, it's quite different to many of the uh, kind of plotting libraries. It's probably closest to matplotlib. Uh, so there'll be some familiarity from uh, plotting in Python, but it, it goes even beyond what matplotlib uh, can do and how it works it, because it's based on this idea of the grammar of graphics. And there are whole books on ggplot2 if you are really interested in this. Um, it, yeah, it, there's so many resources online. Um, if you just Google ggplot2 resources, um, people do weird and wonderful things with ggplot and create very, very interesting different graphs. Um, so plenty of online resources around this. But what we're going to give you today is an introduction to this grammar of graphics. So, gg, uh, so ggplot plots are built out of a series of different components. And the main first component, you get the, the ggplot object. And then what we do is we add geometry layers to it. So this is where we're actually um, adding our data into the plot object, uh, whether these be points or lines or box plots, you know, those all those kind of different geometries that we want to use. Then we get aesthetics, and this is one of the things that's quite different about ggplots is that it uses um, uh, aesthetics mapping to be able to map either to the whole plot or to individual layers, and we'll see how that works. Then we can add all our labels. They will go in separately. And then we've got something called faceting specifications. And basically what these are is how you want to lay out your plot or multiple plots. Um, it allows you to do gridded plots and um, plots by plots um, and is developed to be able to make that all look nice and for it to be done with relative ease once you understand the grammar of graphics. Um, and then coordinate systems, because we can do a lot of coordinate system transformations on our um, data as well. Uh, yeah, on our, on our plot. So let's have a look at a simple generic template for, uh, for a ggplot plot. So a plot always starts with initiating the ggplot object. And this is using the function ggplot. So that is always the same. And that just um, initiates the plot object and says, I'm going to start building a plot. And, no, and at this point, what we normally do is pass in the data set to the object itself. And that's done with the argument data equals and our data set name. One important thing to note is that ggplot works with um, data frames. So <clears throat> it means that you need to make sure that your data is held as a data frame object. Um, you can't easily pass in single vector information. Um, it won't just take a single column um, or a list. 
it needs to be a data frame object, but R uses data frames um, by default uh, most of the time. So if you've got multiple columns, then you're likely working with a data frame object anyway. And then, so that's our first line. And then we use the, um, the, op the plus operator to basically say, now I want to add extra things to my plot. And kind of convention says that you put the plus at the end of the line and then go to a new line when you're adding a new uh, component to the plot. And then we can call any of our different functions that I mentioned previously. So our geometry layers or aesthetics, labels, faceting coordinate systems, and they go next. And so we add our function and then our aesthetics mappings for that layer tend to go in with the mapping keyword and then a call to the, uh, to the aesthetics layer and we add them in. And we'll see how all this works. This is just to build gradually and start showing you how um, a ggplot is constructed. So we'll see lots and lots of examples of, the, of this happening. But yeah, let's, move, let's have a go first of all. So you have um, a file called, let me just make sure I get the right file name. Uh, so it's ggplot underscore code dot r. So either you can follow along with a blank um, script and uh, type these commands in as we go, or I have provided them in the uh, in the resource in the materials, so you can to save you typing them out and you can go through and run them. So whichever way you'd like to do that. So. What we're going to look at first of all is um, basically uh, bringing in, uh, creating a ggplot object and uh, creating our first graph. ggplot2 has a number of built in data sets, um, and we can use these by calling ggplot2 colon colon and then the name of the data set that we want to bring in. And this particular data set, MPG, is all about uh, its uh, cars. So engine sizes, fuel efficiency, um, all these sorts of uh, things, number of doors, the number of um, cylinders. It's just a nice uh, example data set to be able to use while plotting because it contains uh, both discrete and continuous data. So we first of all assign this data set to a variable, and I've in this instance just called it MPG. And we're going to assign the data, so our data frame, um, MPG, to a ggplot object using ggplot data equals MPG. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we're going to um, display the uh, displacement of an engine by the efficiency. So what we're going to do is create a scatter graph using point geometry, so individual points, and our mapping is going to map this, uh, the displacement column in our data and the highway efficiency column to X and Y respectively. So what I'll do is just uh, actually need to continue sharing. I will go to here and so this is the file, the ggplot code file that uh, you should all have. Um, start by actually reading, uh, it's substantiated in the library, library ggplot2 and then going to import the data using the ggplot2 colon colon mpg uh, call. And you can see that then I've got the data set. This is 234 observations of 11 variables. 
And if we have a look at this, we can see we get the car manufacturer, the car model, the uh, engine displacements, so that's the engine size, the uh, year that the car was built, the number of cylinders, the type of transmission, uh, the drive type, so uh, front wheel drive, rear wheel drive or four wheel drive, um, the city efficiency, uh, fuel efficiency, the highway efficiency, the, I'm not sure what L FL stands for, no, oh that might be petrol, no, electric, not sure. Not sure what FL stands for. If you work that out, let us know. Um, and the class as well. So whether it's a compact vehicle, minivan, pickup, SUV, you can tell this is an American data set um, by the nomenclature. And so it's, it's, this is our data and this is, this is what it looks like. And this is what we can plot directly from. So what we're going to do is if I show you here, we can create a plot, blank plot object by just reading in our data. But what you'll notice is down here in the plots window, we just got a blank gray plot. It's, uh, it hasn't actually put anything up there. Now, that, uh, what we can do is we want to add our uh, geometry layer so that we actually get something in our plot. And so that's going to be our geometry point. And the mapping, we're going to map onto the geometry, the point geometry layer, the aesthetics of X and our X and Y axes. And that's going to be the engine displacements, the engine size and the highway efficiency. Now, when you run uh, command for a, a ggplot plot, you need to run the whole thing. You can't, it, it doesn't, it doesn't always like it. Like it. Yes. Uh, could everyone, everyone make sure, make sure they're, they're, they're muted, muted, please? please. I'm getting feedback. Um, that uh, you've got, um, that it doesn't always automatically read the plus through, um, so it's best to select the whole plot command, all of the plot commands, and run them together. So when we run that, we can then see that we've got the engine displacement along the x-axis here, and the highway efficiency, so the number of uh, miles per gallon um, on the uh, on the y-axis and so this is all nicely plotted for us just as a pl nice plain plot okay so just before i carry on any questions at the moment no okay so now the aesthetics arguments allow us to do a lot. We can change um, lots of different uh, parameters about uh, each uh, layer that we're adding in. And particularly useful with our geometry layers, and this is where we can change the kind of the color of the um, of the points, the size of the points, or the line, uh, the um, the alpha, which is the, um, that's the uh, transparency, the transparency or opacity, but yes, either one, how um, clear or dark they are, and the shape as well. And what you'll see is that there are um, a number of different examples in the code here, where we have, we can do things like coloring by, uh, here we've got class. And if we look at the data here, I'm cut, we're coloring by this class column. And so uh, using a discrete 
um, a discrete uh, variable and coloring using that to determine splitting it up by different colors there. We can also do that for the size, the alpha, the shape, and we can manually cut set um, all of these as well by passing in actual values. Now, as you go through, have a go with um, running each of these plots. Look at the console and see what different warnings come up as not all types of variables are uh, partic are the best type to use for um, setting particular aesthetics. So run it by class. Now this is nice. We get a um, different colors for all of our uh, different classes. So we can start to look at which class of car, uh, which class of vehicle has the greatest efficiency, engine efficiency in this instance. Now, if I run this for the size, now I get the warning message. Using size, size for a discrete variable is not advised. And this makes sense because um, size is a continuous variable. So we'd be better off using a continuous variable, um, perhaps something more like a city efficiency um, in this instance. But it's still rendered the plot for us here. And we can see that it's attributed different sizes in regular intervals uh, to the uh, different points dependent on their class. We can also do this for the alpha. And here you can see this is the, uh, the opacity of the points. So from light to dark. And again, we get this using alpha for a discrete variable is not advised. It does try to pick uh, good breaks in um, in the alpha, but that's uh, it's it's not the best way to do it. You're better off using a continuous variable. And then we can also do this for the shape. And here, um, the shape palette can deal with a maximum of six discrete values because more than six becomes difficult to discriminate. Now, that's an interesting point about building plots, that actually having too many classes can make it really difficult to see the data. Um, so actually, ggplot's being really helpful on how to build your plot itself. Um, and you can see that there are all these different uh, shapes of um, uh, shaped point and if you go in the uh, ggplot folder there is there's some notes uh, in there which uh, I wrote when writing this um, and these are all the different examples but it also contains all the different uh, point shapes uh, this can easily be found with a quick google as well uh, for ggplot2 point shapes, but these are all the different shapes of point that you can have. And they're denoted by the denoted by a number. And so if you want to manually uh, assign a shape to a point, you would just uh, use the, the numbers in a concatenated um, vector uh, and pass that into the um, the shape argument. We can also set the, so this is when we're setting everything manually. So here we're calling a color and just giving it as a string input. So here we're using just blue and that just colors all of our points blue. 
So it's kind of similar to the other plotting libraries that we've seen in matplotlib um, and in base R, um, but we just, it's uh, just that it's sat within the uh, the point, uh, the geometry layer itself that we're uh, setting this. Okay. Any questions about aesthetics thus far? Okay. Labels. It's always handy to be able to set some labels so we know what our plot is about and what our different um, axes represent. Uh, this is done nice and simply in ggplot2 uh, in that we just use the labs component and after we've set our um, geometry layer we can then set the labels as well and they take this uh, there's a variety of arguments uh, the most common ones will be title um, and just put your title in it as a string in between quotes and the x and y labels those are the ones you'd normally be setting that there are extra ones as well and when you're dealing with multiple axes um, so when we run this in R, see we get the title up the top and the labels on the X and Y axes. Now, yeah, labels are very simple. Again, um, look at the ggplot documentation if you want to add other labels as well. You can add uh, labels to the points, but obviously you don't want to do that if you've got too many points. Um, it's not always the most handy thing to do. Facet wrapping. Okay, now th this is one that um, took me a little while to get my uh, head around, as facet wrapping is, is not the clearest term. Um, but this is how the plots are split up and organized within the, um, the graph canvas, within that graph area. So um, if we want to create individual graphs by a particular variable, so we can split them out um, across individual small graphs, rather than having them all in a single graph, we can do, you do this using a facet wrap layer. And so here we're going to create individual small graphs by the class of vehicle. So where we uh, colored the points earlier, now we're going to split those, uh, the class of vehicles out into small little um, graphs themselves. And we're going to split them down into two rows. So when we go in and run this, What we get is we can see our class here is each individual small graph and the um, our X and Y, our displacement and our highway efficiency are still plotted on our uh, X and our Y axes. But these are just replicated on each, um, each graph. And the regularity of this uh, kind of latticing of the graphs uh, makes it very easy to create these uh, these graphs. And ggplot is okay with dealing with uh, unequal rows. Um, so here we've got four on the top and three on the bottom. ggplot has has dealt with that as a lot like there to be equal numbers of uh, rows and columns, or oh, um, 
yeah, your rows to be equal and your columns to be equal. So it's very simple to create those plots. It's just a facet wrap layer. Or we can also plot by two different variables. So um, in order to be able to make easy comparisons, it's quite useful for making comparisons, we can use a facet grid uh, uh, layer for this. And this time we're going to do the drive type by the number of cylinders. So that's the whether it's front wheel drive, rear wheel drive, four wheel drive, and the number of cylinders. Uh, so four, five, uh, four, six, eight cylinders. And when we run this, what it's done is we still got our X and Y of highway efficiency and the engine displacement. But we've also got this, the data now split up by our, um, uh, by the drive, uh, by, sorry, by the number of cylinders along the top here, four, five, six, and eight, and the drive type, four wheel drive, front wheel drive, rear wheel drive. And so we can start to look at different facets of the data here. And in this instance, looking at things like the displacement and the highway efficiency, if we're looking for the most efficient vehicles, we're seeing that the uh, four cylinder front wheel drive vehicles have with low displacement have the greatest efficiency on the highway. However, a lot of them are actually quite similar to larger engined vehicles, but it's the front wheel drive vehicles in particular are the most fuel efficient. And the four wheel drive are the least efficient. So we can start visually analyzing our data in this way. And it's, it's, it's very useful to be able to use these grids, um, uh, this kind of grid layout to make, be able to make these comparisons. But it's that easy, it's, it's one line. Um, because of the data frame set up here, this is what makes uh, R so easy to work with in this way and ggplot integrates with it so well is that we are just, that as, the, as it's a data frame, we can just call the column names and it becomes no more complex than that because we've passed in our data, we know what the data frame is and we just call the column names. Okay, any questions at the moment? Okay, yeah, excellent. Racing through uh, ggplot, I'm uh, happy about that. <laughs> um, okay, multiple geometry layers. Let's have a look at when we want to add more and different types of geometry layers. So there are absolutely loads of geometry layers. And I'm, I'll just show you the uh, uh, this link that I put in here. And this is a useful, um, a useful resource about looking at uh, different geometry layers. Um, and here we got, there is a list of all of the different geometry layers that you get. And so this is everything from um, points, paths, ribbons, segments, rectangles, text, text layers for adding in um, additional text on your graph. Um, and this nicely actually breaks uh, the geometry layers down into distinct categories. So, thing, so that it can help you think about what type of graph to use with the type of data that you're trying to plot. Um, and so we've got 
bar graphs in here. Uh, if we've got continuous data uh, with one variable, we've got to hit, we can use histograms, density plots, dot plots, and frequency polygons. Uh, with two variables, points, um, a rug. I'm, I've never done a rug plot, so I'd be interested to see what that looks like. Um, different density plots. Um, it, the list goes on. We've even got violin plots. I know they're very popular at the moment. Box plots, and we'll look at look at an example of those. Um, being able to put error bars and crossbars very easily on your plots as well. Um, contour plots are possi uh, possible to do, and um, tiles. These are particularly useful for uh, heat maps. Um, so this is the main uh, set of geometry layers and those that you most commonly use. Um, and I think there are even more than that. <laughs> uh, ggplot's one of those that uh, people do keep adding to it and adding new, as, as new graph types become popular, they do add to it. So, um, Let's have a look at using the smooth layer, and we're going to define the uh, line type. So we'll plot it first of all, just as uh, doing a smooth line. And then we're going to break our um, smooth line down as a uh, by line type. So if we plot our displacement and a highway efficiency again, just so that we've got a consistent uh, baseline of what we're looking at here. So this is still displacement and highway efficiency, and we plot this as a smooth line. This is what we get. Here we get a smooth line, and what we also get is um, an indication of the spread of the data Across, um, I believe this is uh, what representing one standard deviation of the data between our breakpoints. And so that's a nice representation. It's just um, intuited the curve. And here it's saying, so it's just a, a very simple regression formula that it's using to uh, impute the, uh, the smooth line. And then if we split this down by the drive type, so four wheel drive, front wheel drive and rear wheel drive, what it produces us is three different lines and gives us the um, a line, individual line for each of these different drive types. So again, actually we can see a lot in this data that um, kind of imputed probably on average you know, we're seeing on average here that um, the uh, four-wheel drive cars are uh, less fuel efficient overall um, across all engine types, and that the um, the front-wheel drive cars are those that are more fuel efficient um, across the engine displacements. We can add, so where we had our points before, we can also add these in and color these by the drive type. So we can see the individual data that we've got here. And so we can see the individual data points with imputed um, uh, in, uh, an imputed regression line within them and start to see the spread of the data and the um, kind of uh, which um, start asking questions of this about what uh, which points might be um, our outliers here um, oh they're really fuel efficient which cars are those I'd like a fuel efficient car or I'd like a really dirty, um, uh, not fuel efficient car. 
<laughs> rather inefficient car. Um, but this is how you can build, you can build up multiple layers and create different graphs. Um, and because it's made up of um, these individual geometry layers, it makes it very easy to create quite unique graphs that can give you, if you're wanting to convey a particular insight, you can, you can add on these layers, um, you know, kind of clear down data points. So if you wanted to, um, for example, really pull out the front wheel drive cars here, um, you might change the alpha, the opacity of the rear wheel drive and the four wheel drive so that they're less prominent and just have the, uh, the front wheel drive cars stand out more. Right, okay. So what we've seen here is that in the previous example, in so when we've added when we're adding multiple layers here, we initiate our object, our ggplot object, and then we do our geometry, uh, our geometry layers and the point layer, and we pass in what our um, our aesthetics are, our x and y. Um, what our X and Y are and our color. And in the smooth in the uh, smooth geometry layer, we also, we have to do this again. Uh, we pass in the displacement and highway efficiency arguments. Um, this is replication. We don't like replication in our code because it makes us write more. Um, so we can do something called global mapping and when we do global mapping ggplot, this basically means that we are uh, providing to all subsequent layers a particular set of aesthetics. And in, you can see from this example here that if we put the mapping equals aesthetics and our x and y arguments in the ggplot object, we then don't have to put them into our geometry layers. They are automatically passed to the geometry layers. So just to show you here, this creates exactly the same graph as we had previously. Two versions of the same graph, but um, we only have to declare our mapping of our X and Y um, variables once. Okay, plots with bins. So uh, when we split uh, data down into discrete, um, by discrete categories or uh, by uh, breaks in the data, this is called, they're called bins as I'm sure you're familiar with, and bar charts and histograms uh, use bins all the time. And so this is an example of creating a bar graph of the classes and taking the count of the number of vehicles in each class. So we run this bit, see this here, that we're just using a bar layer, geom bar layer. Um, and we because it's just one variable, we just pass in our x variable for this. And you can see this creates, uh, we've got a count of the number of vehicles that fall into each class. So we could also do this same, uh, create the same graph by using a statistical transformation. There are, there's a number of um, built in statistical transformations that could be performed on your data. And basically this, it just transforms the data and creates a new input for your plot. 
And here, just to exemplify this, we've got the stat count. Um, so we're just going to count the number of uh, vehicles in number of instances of each class. So this is basically the same as, it is exactly the same as creating a bar graph. And you get the same graph. Um, this can be useful when you're working across particularly um, uh, multiple classes or, you know, doing a facet wrap and um, working with comparing multiple variables. Right. We can also use different coordinate systems on our plots. And this is useful when you want to change the orientation or the uh, manipulate the type of plot that you're using. So here we've got um, the box plot geometry layer that we're going to use. And you can see that we're passing our aesthetics in globally. So these don't need to go into the box plot layer. And then what we're going to do is perform a coordinate flip on them. So creating a box plot of all of the different classes and their highway efficiency, which is a very nice, neat box plot. And then Say we want it round the other way. We pass a, the chord flip transformation to it um, as an additional uh, layer, and that flips our coordinates round the other way, swapping X and Y. Now, important one, saving your plots. Our studio makes it quite nice and easy. Um, with uh, being able to just select the export button and we can save as an image or a PDF. We can also from uh, ggplot directly save our plot as well. This means if you've set um, a custom scale or um, uh, resolution on your plot, then you're not uh, because the plot window will output the plot to this size. It's um, depending on how large, if, if you uh, change the size of the plot in the plot window, it will output the plot in that size. So using the GG save, we can maintain the aspect ratio that we want on our plot. And so here, um, this particular plot, we've got, um, this, is, this is a bit of a fun one, just to show uh, some of the uh, power of what um, you can do with uh, ggplot. So we're going to use a bar layer, uh, create a bar graph uh, with the classes, and going to uh, fill them uh, and color them by the uh, class. I'm going to turn off the legend and uh, the width is going to be uh, equal to one. Then we've got this interesting uh, call theme and theme basically overrides any of the uh, visual parameters of the graph and particularly in relation to things like the aspect ratio, the resolution on the graph. Um, that's an interesting advanced, advanced feature that um, if you get, if you start using ggplot um, to a lot, then you'll come across that more. So here we're just gonna set an aspect ratio of one, so one to one. Uh, so it maintains uh, a square. We're, not going to have any labels on our axes, and you'll see why in a minute. Well, you'll see why when you run this. 
So if we just run this top part without the bar, so uh, if we run this top part, and I'll discuss what's happening afterwards in a minute. So here it gives us an object. It's actually passed the ggplot object to a variable rather than plotting it here in the window. If I type bar in the console, I can output that in the plot window. So this is the plot that uh, we just created, but it's been assigned to a variable as well, uh, as, as a save in memory as a uh, ggplot object. Um, and so there's, there's a list of parameters which are associated with that. When we pass a ggplot object to a variable, we can then subsequently perform additional um, transformations on it. And so, for example, here we could do a coordinate flip and turn it round to the side. And then again, by calling the bar object, we could also transform it to polar coordinates. Um, so these kind of transformations allow you to be able to use a base graph and then change it in multiple ways for different, and look at different ways of presenting it. We can then save our plot using ggsave. Uh, we give it, we put in the file name that we want it to be saved as, and then uh, plot and what the name of the plot is that we want to save. And depending on where your working directory is set, let me just check where my working directory is set. Put it in a more sensible place. If you haven't set your working directory already, I would recommend doing so. I'm just going to go to my HSMA folder and I'm going to put it in my ggplot folder. Set that as my working directory now and I save my plot. That's now been saved and I can open that and that's got the bar object. Note that that is not the polar transformation or the um, coordinate flip transformation graph. That is the bar object that was saved because if we wanted to save the coordinate, uh, the uh, polar coordinate version, we'd have to overwrite the bar object here and pass or create a new uh, instance of the object. Okay, um, I'm just going to briefly show you, we can also, uh, as this will be useful for later on, um, there is the histogram layer and we can nice and easily create nice histograms of our data. So we've got the highway efficiency and the frequency of that split down by the breaks. And what you can, what you get here is uh, a comment in the console saying the bin size that it's that's being used here. Um, so well, it's, it's the number of bins. So our scale, our, um, our range of data has been split up into 30 equally sized or as near to equally sized bins as possible. And you can use, um, you can change the bin, the number of bins in the uh, histogram layer, depending on how you want it split out. Okay, um, any questions at the moment um, before we go into a little exercise? And I'm going to ask you to have a good old go at this on your own. No. So um, this is a kind of generic template um, for the structure of graphical grammar. 
Um, it's this plot creating a plot object, passing our data in, our geometry layers go in. These take our aesthetics mappings, any statistical um, transformations we want to perform, and some position arguments as well. I haven't touched on that, but that's something that uh, we'll be able to look at. Um, and then our coordinate trans any coordinate transformations and our uh, faceting functions um, if we want to create uh, multiple subplots. So that's kind of just a little reminder of uh, how, how this uh, structure works. OK, I would like you to have a go at creating um, your own uh, your own uh, graph or graphs and just have a go at creating a graph or graphs that um, show something interesting about the, uh, the Midwest data set that's part of ggplot. So this is um, some uh, socio-demographic um, and socio-economic data about the Midwest back in the I think in the 90s, um, 90s and 2000s. But yeah, this is a um, one of another one of the built-in data sets. And oh, how long did I say that we were going to have for? Uh, when are we going to break? So I think if we have. Um, If we do the exercise, and if we come back, at, uh, well, let's take a decent break. Um, come back at five past eleven, and so have a play with um, the plotting for uh, twenty minutes, and take a fifteen-minute comfort break as well. And we'll come back at five past eleven. We're a little bit ahead of ourselves, which is good as uh, I, I get the feeling the other bits are going to be potentially even harder. <laughs> and yeah, have a good play with uh, ggplot, try some different transformations, and we'll see see where you get to with, with that. If you could um, post at, uh, so by five past 11, if you could post one example of a graph in the, um, our Slack channel in the well in the uh, for session uh, yeah session four Slack channel which one sorry module four if you post uh, in the module four um, Slack channel and just post one example of a graph and so we can just see the different range of graphs that uh, people have been creating. That would be great to share that with with everybody else. And that's great. See you at um, at five past five past eleven. Right. Okay. So um, I hope that was uh, interesting to have a play with ggplot2 and to see the types of things that you can do with it. It's a very, very versatile plotting library. And the more that you get into it, you'll see the way that people are combining different layers and tweaking different layers and using them. And there's additional functionality that you can bring in, which makes the just go to town with uh, with plots. If you've got a plot that you can think of, you can make it with ggplot. Um, and there's some additional resources that I put in the uh, presentation. And uh, so where uh, I've taken a lot of my examples from um, from Alpha Data Science from the Alpha Data Science website, which itself is a great resource. It's a New Zealand-based blog. 
and um, there is a full list of the functions and the function reference. This is the um, the actual ggplot2 um, documentation, and it's part of the tidyverse, uh, which is something that you might have heard of. Um, yeah, tidyverse is a wider suite of packages that's kind of make um, plotting and data transformation easy. Um, ggplot I find that uh, is, is the most most useful out of out of that and uh, there's also this uh, uh, blog as well on ggplot2 layers for understanding the different geometries and also with summaries of the other layers uh, and the component types as well and there's some other um, kind of uh, advanced exercises and advanced functionality for ggplot2 in the uh, R for data science graphics for communication blog. Um, yeah, some really, really nice uh, stuff around how to think about creating graphs for clear and concise communication of what you're trying to um, show with the plot. Okay, let's move on to distribution fitting with fit dist R plus. Okay, now distribution fitting is a fairly simple process uh, and a very complex one at the same time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> it is an art. There are no hard and fast uh, rules to fitting distributions um it is estimation it's all about estimation of your data um a lot of the hard and fast techniques only work with um particularly large samples of data which sometimes you don't have um and they are also quite finicky about their assumptions within the data so a lot of things like goodness of fit tests often show rejection of a, a particular distribution when you fit it, but actually the distribution is a good estimation. So we'll be talking about the uh, graphical fitting, the visual fitting of data um, and fitting of distributions uh, predominantly, <clears throat> but also showing how you can get the stats out um, and talking a little bit about some of the stats uh, around distribution fitting. Okay, so yeah, the, the basis of the distribution fitting process is look at the shape of your data, see, see what kind of curve is being described by it, normally using a histogram. Then fit your data to likely distributions and the more that you do this the more you get used to estimating the different types of distribu distributions and also understanding the difference uh, different distributions for discrete data and for continuous data and so so you have a go at fitting your data and then it's just checking the fit and as i say this is done both visually and statistically. Right. <clears throat> so the first bit, let's plot our data and have a look at it. Um, so we call in our library fit distar plus. And again, we're going to use a built-in package in the um, in the fit distar plus uh, package. Can use a built-in data set called ground beef. Uh, apologies to any uh, vegetarians or vegans out there, or pesc pescatarians, or whichever atarians you may be. Um, as uh, <laughs> this is about servings of ground beef and the, uh, the size of the serving. And the data for this is a, a single column of data, uh, and the column's called serving and we're going to assign that to the variable my data uh, so here we are and i've provided this code again 
you can either follow along and type it out yourself or as everything's in the slides or um, there's the dist fit code in the distribution fitting uh, folder that you've got. So we've got our, we read in our library and then we can read in our, our data. So we get ground beef, which is 254 observations of one variable. And then I just assign that to uh, my data and plot that. And this is our data. So there's just uh, the 254 observations plotted in, or in uh, the order in which they are in the data. And this shows we've got quite a, uh, a wide range in servings of ground beef sizes. Now, plotting it just as our data, just as a scatter graph like this is um, not particularly useful. It allows us to see the kind of the extents of our data and how it's organized within the data vector that we have. The most useful way to plot your data first of all, for, um, uh, for uh, distribution fitting is uh, to create a histogram. Now, drawing on our knowledge now of ggplot, I have uh, created a uh, histogram here. And you can see we've got the ggplot object and bringing in the ground beef data. Note I'm not using the my data variable here. That's because the my data variable is an array. It's a vector, a single vector of data. But um, ggplot doesn't like um, vectors. It likes data frames, as we discussed earlier. So I'm using the ground beef data frame for that. And then I'm using the um, histogram geometry layer, bringing in the serving column as our x variable and also setting the number of bins here i said that you could change the number of bins this i've set at 10 and um, you can play about and run this um, as many times as you want with different uh, numbers of bins that's actually a really good thing to do when looking at your data as a histogram so if we run that we can see i've got 10 bins here and this is the data I'm being shown. Now, if I change this to 20 bins, see the data looks quite different <laughs> um, as we start to see the data more separated out. Um, it's important to try and understand the shape of your data using uh, the histogram and different bin sizes because it'll look different at different resolutions. So that's kind of one first note on kind of graphical estimation of your distribution. Look at it as a histogram, look at it at different resolutions of bins. Okay. Now, the first um, uh, after we've got kind of looked at it as a basic histogram, we then have there's uh, within the uh, fit dist r plus package, there is this, uh, there's a lot of useful functions for um, graphically assessing your data. And the two of the basic ways is to use the empirical density and the cumulative distribution. And this is done using the plot dist, so plot your distribution function. I'm passing in the my data, the vector of data. And I want a histogram. I've set that to true. And the empirical density as well. I'd like to be able to see that. And so the empirical density is essentially the equivalent of the uh, to a histogram, 
and it's given the density of the observations rather than the frequency. And the cumulative distribution adds up the, um, the density of the observations. So let's have a go at running this. So this is just a single line here, plot dist. And down here we now get our empirical density and cumulative distribution plots. Here we can see histogram of the density of um, observations within our data and uh, an estimated curve fitted to this as well. So just to give you an idea of the shape of the data. And then you get the cumulative distribution over here, <clears throat> which is adding up these densities. Um, and so we can see that there is a gradual increase and some stepped increases where we get large changes at particular values, larger changes at particular values. Um, if we had smoother curves, then it would, in um, and different shapes of this would intimate dis different distributions. So these are two very useful um, plots just to give you an idea of what your data is looking like. And the more data that you look at, the more you'll get used to uh, looking at these distributions and uh, understanding kind of what they relate to, what types of distribution you're likely to be looking at. Now, this data in particular kind of represents a log normal distribution and log normal is a skewed normal distribution um, and it's uh, negatively skewed so skewed to the uh, towards the left hand side of our graph so we get a rise and then a decrease and <clears throat> so at the moment i'm thinking oh this is maybe something around a log normal however we've got some shapes in here some some wibbles in it that might throw a log normal distribution off but um, that's kind of roughly where i'm thinking it's not an exponential distribution uh, as we don't have high values um, at the start of our data and it's not normal because it's not symmetrical um, so we can start to weed out some different um, uh, distributions. Now, the next thing to look at is to look at the, uh, the skew and the kurtosis of the graph. Now, the skew is positive or negative skew. This depends on whether the peak is uh, sub symmetrical within the data, which is no skew, whether it's towards the um, whether it's towards the uh, y axis, in which instance it's positive skew. And if it's towards the upper end of our x axis, then it's the it's negative skew. So it depends how the peak of the curve is shifted along our x-axis in relation to the rest of the data. And the kurtosis is the uh, the sharpness of the peak of the curve. So um, how depending on how steep it is or whether it's a smooth topped curve. And here you can see that um, within this, uh, so we can assess this, assess the shape in terms of skewness and kurtosis using the um, desk disk dist function, which is descriptive, uh, describe the distribution, essentially. I think that's what it's trying to say. And you'll note that there's a function, uh, an argument in here, which is called discrete. 
if you're using non-continuous data, so you've got discrete data, whether it's category counts, uh, sorry, if it's categories or if it's um, integer data only, then it's not continuous, then we need to change that to true. There's also a boot argument in it, which because this performs bootstrapping to look at the um, the ends of our data. And basically, this is around uh, looking at other filling in some of the other very um, other um, possible data points that might in, be included in the larger data set. It basically runs a short simulation performing bootstrap. So, and the data, to, uh, the type of graph that this is going to produce is something called a Cullen and Frey graph. It's also got several other names, um, but it's quite easy to recognize. In this instance, it's referred to a Cullen and Frey graph. So, if we run this now, with our data. Right, so we get our Cullen and Frey graph produced here. Now, there's a lot going on in this graph. And what we have is the blue dots here represents our observations. This is our data. We've then got uh, bootstrap values, which is uh, basically uh, simulation runs on uh, other possible um, uh, data points existing around our data, extending the distribution. And on our x-axis, we've got the square of skewness, and on the y-axis, the ketosis. So this is looking at the how far the data is skewed and how sharp the peak happens to be. Now, what it gives you here is some theoretical distributions. So some named theoretical distributions, the normal, uniform distribution, exponential, logistic, beta distribution, log normal, and gamma. And stating that uh, the Weeble um, distribution is close to gamma and not normal. So a similar estimate. What we are looking at is so the, sh the sharpness of the curve and the um, and how skewed it is along the x axis. And these are traded off against each other. So let's take the example here of the uniform distribution, which is easy. So that's normally, that's just a basically a flat line. Every value has an equal probability of being selected. And that means that there's no peak because it's just a flat line. So your ketosis is very low, which is why it's up here close to the one value. So it's basically it's flat or near as flat. And skewness, there's no skew on it because it's just it's it's a pure it's a symmetrical distribution. And that holds the symmetry holds for the normal distribution here, represented by the asterisks by the star. And that again also is a symmetrical distribution, so there's no skew but it has a curve at the top. So it, uh, its ketosis is, um, is of a higher value. And so thinking about it like that, that we can start to see where our data sits in this um, kind of range. And giving the other example of a exponential distribution, exponential distributions tend to be a sharp curve or a, a curve which is heavily skewed and it has a sharp peak because it disappears off into infinity normally. 
and so the kurtosis and skew, skewness values are high for the exponential distribution which is why it's down here. Now the log normal and gamma distributions tend to sit somewhere around there um, and so they have some skew and can have a sharp peak but they they're, they're shown here as, as lines and our data is sitting quite close to uh, these lines and so it's showing that we have a bit of skew on our data and that there is a curve, there is a peak, it's not flat, um, but it's not a really sharp peak as well. So that's telling us that because our observed data isn't sitting close to one of these other name distributions, it sat on this uh, gamma line, we're probably looking at something like a gamma distribution. That would be a good one to try, first of all. So that's kind of how you interpret these Cullen and Frey graphs. A statistician would probably pull my interpretation apart there. But um, <laughs> in terms of um, on the fly, kind of uh, pragmatic um, estimation of distributions from Cullen and Frey graph, this, these are the kinds of things that you need to be thinking about. Um, just pause there. Are there any uh, questions around the uh, Cullen and Frey graphs so far? No? Okay. Right. So the thing that we need to do next is to fit our data and we have to choose which distributions to fit our data to. Um, it's these visual methods that help us to estimate and have a guess at which distributions are likely going to fit. Um, that's not perfect, but that's, that's kind of the art of distribution fitting. And this is, you know, a, a good way to start. So, I was saying that uh, we sat close to the gamma line and that's also close to the log normal. You know, I thought it kind of had a log normal shape to it to start off with. And the Weeble distribution is also close to the uh, gamma and log, log normal distribution. So it's worth testing that as well. Now, what I've done is given two different, slightly different um, implementations of the uh, distribution fitting function here. The first is an individual, fitting individual distributions. So um, you use the fit dist function to fit a distribution. Pass in the data and then we use a character string of the name of the distribution that we want to fit. All of the name distributions that are included in the fit dist uh, plus uh, R plus package are in the documentation. And you just need to go through and look uh, for those name distributions. It's worth learning to do that yourself. Um, I could give you the list and you could use that as a reference, but actually the documentation, will, you just go to the documentation for this function and it will tell you the named function, the name distributions that it takes as inputs. And there's about, um, about 15 of them. And so we, um, oh, got that one. Um, so uh, we just uh, save our, uh, or assign our uh, fitted distrib uh, fitting data uh, from the fit disk function to a new, uh, new variable. And then we use summary and the uh, variable name, although in this one, in this instance, I've uh, put this in incorrectly, it should be W. Um, 
and yeah, and that will give us a, a, the summary statistics for the fitting of that distribution. In this implementation below, um, there is, you can fit uh, more than one distribution at a time, um, because often you'll be wanting to test a few. So this is just how you would implement that uh, by creating a uh, list of the distributions, creating a, another list in which we want to save the fitting, fitting data. And then we just loop through the distributions and fit them and save them into our uh, fitted data list. And then to print that, we just loop through the fit list and uh, print out the summary data for that. So it's just how to do this individually with one distribution and to do it for multiple distributions as well. <clears throat> so here we've got a few different implementations. So looking at Weeble, uh, Gamma and Log Normal and then printing uh, individual summaries, but you'd have to change this summary function every time. And there's also the, um, the iterative approach of looping through them. So I'm just going to run this looped one. And you can see that it's printed out the summaries for the gamma, log normal, and Weeble distributions. And what we get here are a series of um, statistics uh, that estimate the uh, the goodness of, well it's not the goodness of it it's the uh, that um, estimate how well the distribution fits the, um, the the data itself so what we're trying to find is something um, yeah, uh, I didn't actually, <laughs> I was hoping to get on to interpreting these uh, statistics, um, but there wasn't actually any information on what these mean um, online, or I, I hadn't been able to find any. <laughs> um, so they, they're they unfortunately uh, a little, I'm not able to make them as meaningful as they should be at the moment. Um, but essentially, these are taken as inputs when you do a goodness of fit test. These are the statistics that describe the fit and basically the deviation of the real data from the, uh, the theoretical distribution that you're trying to fit to. OK, so in terms of the stats can get a little bit laborious and meaningless. Um, the way that they are normally interpreted is visually. So when we go through, we can plot a, uh, there's four particular uh, graphs that are of greatest use when uh, assessing the fit of a uh, name distribution to your observed data, your empirical data. What we're going to do here is plot as a two by two grid, these four plots, and they're going to be the, um, the density, uh, the cumulative density, QQ plot and the PP plot. Now, when we run these, We're going to run them for all three of our, um, so it includes all three. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I oh, know. Hang on. I've run the second one. That's the one. Okay. So just to explain the difference here is that this first implementation is if you've individually saved the fitted distributions. 
and this one's actually using our list of uh, iterative list of um, uh, distri uh, distribution, uh, fitted distributions. So then we get our four graphs over here. Um, so we have the histogram and theoretical densities, empirical and theoretical cumulative densities, densities, QQ plot and the PP plot. Now, we can see here the this uh, first graph, the histogram, is in some in some ways uh, one of the most useful. It allows us to see the theoretical distribution given by these curves, the green, red, and blue curves, for each of the different distributions, and how they fit to the data. And we can see that in relation to our real data here. So we can see that they're kind of estimating the shape of the data fairly well. Um, each of them actually estimating different components of it better than others. So for example, the log normal distribution is estimating the height of this, um, the peak in the data here very well. But actually, it's not doing such a good job at estimating um, the uh, next component of the data or um, yeah, it, it kind of trails trails off a little bit here. The gamma distribution gives us a slightly more even estimate, but it is over, overestimating these values here within the distribution. And the Weeble distribution is underestimating the peak and overestimating these values in uh, the middle of the distribution here. And so there's trade-offs when you're picking a distribution to use within your model, because it's always going to um, overestimate some data and underestimate others. It's, um, it is an estimate. It's a, uh, a representation of your data. And this is, believe it or not, a good thing. Um, we're quite often in a model, particularly when we are uh, looking to extrapolate from a model, so looking into the future um, or, and testing other scenarios, we actually don't want our distribution to fit our data 100%. That's called overfitting. And that basically means that there's no space for anomalies and, very, and uh, kind of true random variation to come into the data. It's, it's overfitted. It too well represents what's happening now and what's been observed, not what might happen. Um, so these kind of these underestimations and overestimations in certain areas are not bad things. Um, what we're looking for is something that gives us um, about the right kind of values and the right behavior within our system that we're looking at. When you're uh, doing this for a model, you will uh, undertake, go through distribution fitting test just different distributions and try and get a good estimate. You'll then put them into your model and run your model um, and run it multiple times to see how the values play out. And what you do is you calibrate your model using the um, using your known values over your historical data, the time period that you know that your data represents and see if you're getting a similar distribution of values within your model um, in order to be able to say, okay, my distribution is estimating the mean of my data and the standard deviation well enough for me to say that it's a decent estimate of what is actually, um, it's a decent estimate of what our historical data so shows and how our system is actually functioning. 
and but there's enough variability within it to uh, be able to account for um, kind of uh, spurious occurrences and you know greater variability and change than we will see within the observed data. And so it's it's important to um, go through an iterative process of looking at uh, trying different uh, distributions and then running them in your model and checking your model that it, it looks like the distributions are working correctly, they're giving decent, um, not wild outputs and that you, uh, particularly your means and your standard deviations are looking similar within your kind of your warm up, uh, within your, not your warm up, within your uh, kind of baseline model, baseline of your model, before you start making any changes to the model itself and testing any um, what if or experimental scenarios. So yeah, that's, that's kind of the iterative process that you'll need to go through. And you might need to go back and change um, and pick different distributions because actually they're not working correctly within the model. And you have to find, you know, it might be that you choose the gamma distribution, but actually a log normal might work better um, when it's actually plugged into the model. Yeah, and until you run the model with the distributions, you won't know that. But that's the calibration process, which uh, doesn't get talked about enough, actually. <laughs> it's something that we have to go backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards with. And when you undertake um, uh, any uh, kind of particularly discrete event simulation projects, that calibration is a huge part of the model building process. OK, so, so we're starting to look at our theoretical densities and really um, starting to get some decent estimates of what distributions might fit our data. We can then see with the, uh, the CDF graph that we've got um, the cumulative density as we saw um, earlier when we did our uh, first plots, uh, looking at the shape of the data that's in black here. And then we've got our curves running through that. So what is reassuring here is that uh, the distributions that we've chosen sit within the data and actually give a relatively good estimate. They can't account for these large jumps or large changes. That's because the, they're smooth curves. But they do sit within the data points. So we're on a good, good track here. Then with the QQ plot, and the PP plots. Um, I'll look up what they mean because I don't know what QQ stands for or PP stands for. <laughs> um, mathematicians might pop that in the chat. That's, uh, that's, that's not, not uh, my area of expertise. But essentially with these, what we're looking at is the deviation of the, um, of the observed values from the theoretical values given by the probability distributions. And it's slightly, just slightly different ways of, of actually looking at that. Uh, and what you're wanting to see is your, uh, the points, the colored points, nicely lined up on these black lines, these diagonal lines running through the graph. Anything, any any deviation from that is is deviation of the theoretical distribution from your empirical data. And so, what we're trying to do is minimise this deviation. So here, I'd say actually, we've got quite a lot of deviation um, from the log normal distribution, much more than the gamma and the Weibull distributions. So, I'm thinking that actually we might need to discount the log normal distribution based on this QQ plot. Um, we're getting deviation here as well on the uh, PP plot. Um, but then it's, it's not too, too bad, but it's not perfect. Um, and we'll see that it's definitely not perfect in a moment. So 
actually it was interesting uh we were just just chatting about distribution fitting before this session and uh, uh one, one rule of thumb that uh, you can use with qq and pp plots is that kind of if you can put something along the line you know with a decent margin you know your pencil or your pen over it and um this is how Tom was saying he was taught that uh, if, if you draw if you draw one by hand and then you can put your pencil over it, then um, it's probably OK. It's a decent fit. And this really talks to this kind of visual uh, estimation. Not it's not just a statistical process um, distribution fitting. You can't just go. It says yes. Computer says yes. This is the one that I should use. So. Um, yeah, so sometimes um, this it, this won't actually work. Um, the name distributions that we're using might not actually be be good enough. So um, I'm just going to run this line here in the goodness of fit statistics, which uses the fit and our gamma log normal and uh, Weeble distributions. And if I do, um, if I go up, actually, it would be easier to do it, show you here. So, running a goodness of fit test here, I can show you that um, it's been rejected across three different goodness of fit tests. None of these distributions statistically fit our empirical data. That happens a lot, <laughs> an awful, awful lot, especially where we have jaggedy distributions in empir empirical data. That they don't represent smooth curves. Within operational data, that's really, really common. And actually, it takes a really large number of values to um, get a Good, goodness of fit statistic with um, operational empirical data from human systems because they have such large amounts of variability in them. Um, that it's, it's, it's a, something that we will continuously battle with. If you work in, well, uh, kind of um, more electronics process control, machinery process control, where actually the variation within your data is relatively small and um, it often produces nice smooth curves with large numbers of data points. Um, those, that's great data for distribution fitting. Healthcare um, operations data is not great for distribution fitting. <laughs> um, just, just because of the nature of it, the number of um, uh, observations that you normally have and the variability within it. It's real world, it's messy. You can't rely on these statistics to tell you which distribution you should be using. But if we're going, actually, I want to try and get a better fit, I'm going to try some dis other distributions. Um, We can use. Uh, yeah, I haven't got my slides on that. Um, we can use the uh, Actuar um, package. So this essentially extends the uh, FitDist R plus package and provides a uh, another lot of uh, name distributions that you can test. So. Here, I've just done an example with uh, burrito. Uh, I think that's actually the burrito. Um, uh, the burr is the burrito, um, which I, th I thought was quite tasty. Um, uh, distribution, uh, we've got the log normal and the log logistic in here as well. So we can do distribution fitting with them. And we can also plot, again, all of the um, the theoretical, uh, the theoretical densities, the empirical and theoretical cumulative densities, uh, QQ and PPs. I've just done the CDF um, one here just as an example. 
but they all work with uh, these distributions as well. So yeah, we can um, combine distributions from the uh, FitDist R plus package and from the actual R pa package. So I've included a log the log normal uh, fit here as well, um, so that we can compare that to the log logistic, the uh, Pareto and the burrito. And so here we have you can see our data and the cumulative density uh, up here um, in black. It's getting a little bit messy now, but actually we've got quite a good fit with the uh, log logistic here. And that's actually potentially a better fit than log normal, which is not estimating these lower values so well. So, um, so actually, a log logistic um, distribution might well be the most uh, most useful one, but we'd probably want to uh, look at the other graphs as well. And we can run the goodness of fit statistics on these as well. And these are so look at these. Ah, and actually they've all been rejected again. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> this basically shows that um, with this kind of real data and with only 250 data points, it's quite difficult to um, get a statistically significant fit um, with this kind of data. You can play about this for days and days and days, trying to get uh, get this. In. Um, there are different ways of overcoming uh, such issues. You can use simulated data to create more data points for yourself, um, which can help. Uh, so you impute data points within your data, um, basically bootstrapping. Um, or you can um, go and collect more data or you can use visual fitting. Okay, so there's also, um, we can also estimate the uncertainty parameters around our data. I'm just gonna come back to here. So, um, I haven't got any more slides. Um, so we can also estimate the uncertainty around our parameters and here is an example of that for this, for the burrito distribution. distribution. And basically uh, it's a function called boot dist. And so this is bootstrapping the distribution to try and look at the error estimates. And this takes a little while because the bootstrapping is a basic uh, simulation method. So it's running through and it's run some estimates and so this is giving us uh, whether it's converged or not um, and the confidence intervals that we're looking for. And we can summarize this. So we're looking at um, the median and then the uh, our upper and lower um, percentiles and what the values that, that we're getting um, and how well they fit our observed values. So we can plot our estimates and what we're looking to see here is smooth curves and smooth linear 
smooth correlations within the data points. These are all a bit messy um, across different dimensions of our data. So it's not a great estimate, but it's not bad, essentially. Um, and then we can get um, uh, confidence intervals for the data as well, which allow us to see how how conf how um, how on the level of uncertainty within our uh, our theoretical distribution um, and the uncertainty around it in terms of fitting out to our observed values. So these are useful to be able to see how much uncertainty there is. And so we got our median and then we can see that either side we've got uh, the 95% confidence, confidence interval of each quantile here. Um, so we can use that to plot um, confidence intervals on our distribution should we choose to when describing it. Okay, that's a lot of talking from me. Um, I'm wondering if there's uh, either everybody's um, thoroughly confused or thoroughly happy, perhaps, <laughs> and just see if there's uh, any questions around any of that at the moment. Thank you, Kerry, for uh, quantile, quantile, probability, probability. Plus, yes. Um, <laughs> no, everybody seems very happy. I, I, I guess everybody's just gagging to get on with a um, doing a bit of distribution fitting themselves. Well, you're welcome. You, you, that's exactly what we're going to. That's exactly what we're going to do now. We're going to. <laughs> We're going to look at uh, some example data. So in your folder, in the, uh, so in the uh, distribution fitting folder, you will find there is, uh, we've got the distfit code R file, and there's also taskdata.csv. The taskdata.csv is what you, um, now need to try and fit a distribution to and try and work out which distribution best it is, what, what, what it best fits. Um, have a go, go through the process, go through from the start, going, use the um, slides to help you and the um, code file as well. But go through that process and try and fit different distributions to it. Work out what's happening in the data, what shape it is, um, and have a play. Have a play with that. And if we come back in, have a go at that for 20 minutes. Um, we come back at 25 past, just before lunch. And if everybody, once you've got an S, once you've got, put put your estimate, put the distribution you think it is in the um, module four Slack channel. And uh, let's see what everybody thinks it is. And uh, see if we get a, if our estimates of the distribution converge together into uh, a good estimate of what it should be. Recording. Okay, so web app development with Shiny. So uh, you've probably all heard of Shiny now, um, as it's been used quite a lot to uh, push out uh, COVID related dashboards and tools um, being used by the government quite heavily. It's a nice, simple development environment for um, putting out web apps using our um, integration. 
and it was actually developed by our studio themselves um, and it was developed as a way to develop interactive web apps and to make that process pretty easy and integrate all the kind of our functionality within that. Um, no web development skills are required, um, kind of, uh, with, with the caveat that kind of, um, you, if, if you're going to, if you're developing your own little tools, you kind of don't need a lot of knowledge around web development or anything. Um, a little bit of understanding around good user interface design is helpful. Um, if you're going to deploy your app, then you will need some web development experience. But they are, these apps are fully deploy deployable and scalable. Um, so they can be used by lots and lots of people. They can be deployed via the web on independent servers. And also, actually, I've just seen there's a couple of um, different ways that you can wrap them so they work as executables just within your normal Windows environment. So as a standalone executable file, um, which is really handy. Uh, so people are, it's, it's one of these um, approaches which is being developed more and more and more, and there's more stuff being right. built out yeah. to extend it. And the actual apps themselves can be extended with um, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, allowing for additional functionality, additional components to be brought in, more uh, greater control over the styling and over the uh, kind of format of the pages themselves. What we're going to be working with today, though, is just kind of the uh, kind of beginner introduction to Shiny and getting you used to the format of how um, the app is constructed. That's kind of the main component that we want to get today because everything else is then just building greater and greater and more advanced functionality on top. So, and again, this is built as something which is simple to run. So they've broken down the, um, the app writing into kind of three main components. The first is the app layout. And so this is where everything goes on in, within the app. Then you get the, the functionality itself. And this is referred to as the server um, in shiny nomenclature. And this, this is where all of your actual, you know, what each button will do or each slider will do. The, um, how it produces graphs, that's all going to go in the app functionality section. And then you get the run command, which is a very simple run command saying, use my user interface, use my server, bring it together. So the app layout, let's start there. First things first, it's always good just to work out where you want things to go, what you want your input and output components to be. So um, a generic template about thinking about the user interface in Shiny is that you start by defining your page type. And there are multiple different page types. Um, some are static and some are fluid. And what I mean by this is that some will adapt to the screen size that you've got it on and whether a window, how large a window you're using to display the app. And we'll see examples of this. And others may maintain a more static layout so they won't adapt. Um, and this is all to do with reactive CSS. And uh, if you do get into web development or have done web development before, this is something that will be familiar to you. Um, so there's the page type. And we'll just look at one page type today. But there are others, but kind of the main one that we'll use and that you normally use for uh, these kinds of tools. 
Then we have our navigation components. And so this is anything that we're using to order our input and output components and move about the app itself. Then we have our input components. So anything that we want to be able, we want the user to be able to change within the app. And then our output components. So that's the outputs that we want displayed to the user. Right. So the best way to do this is to look at this by example. So you'll see within the shiny folder that you've downloaded from GitHub, there are a number of examples and they're all called either layout example, reactive example, there are all these different folders. And within that, you'll have an app.r file. And so if you can go into the layout example folder and open the app.r file in there, what you should see is this code here. And to go through and I'm going to go through and explain the different components that we've got here. So these are the uh, just some little overviews of the um, different some of the different components here. Just uh, for reference, if I talk through it on here, so you see that we've defined our UI. We're attributing all of this code at the moment to our UI, our user interface. And that's used as standard nomenclature um, that Shiny recognizes the uh, variable or the object UI as the user interface. So you tend to use UI. I wouldn't go playing about with that um, nomenclature. And then the first thing we do, as I said, is define our page type. And here we've got fluid page. And this is where it's saying, I want you to be reactive and self-organize yourself so that it uh, give me the best layout so it works on different screen sizes and screen types. So whether it's on a phone, on a laptop, or on a desktop, um, we're getting kind of the most optimal layout of our components within the app. And then we open our brackets. And so everything for the user interface is contained within this fluid page call here. And the first thing that I put in here is, well, it's, it's nice to put a title. And we can use the component title panel. And that is uh, takes a string input, which is our title. And I've just put in here my first web app. Then we comma separate our following components. So we put a comma after title panel. And now what we're defining is the type of layout that we'd like to use for the main section of our app. And this, again, is one of those probably want to use something similar to this, although that lots of other layouts as well, um, that we've got sidebar layouts. And what this is, is a layout, as we'll see in a minute, where we have a panel down the right hand side of our um, uh, of our app, and then a main panel to the left hand side. And so we say sidebar panel layout and open some brackets. Now within our sidebar layout, we're going to define the side panel and the main panel. So that's the one on the right hand side, which we can use for all our control inputs and the main panel for displaying our outputs. Nice and neat, it works well, that layout. So we use the, um, the function sidebar panel. And 
open our brackets and within our and now we can define within our sidebar panel what we want our components to be within that panel so anybody who's familiar with um, html will recognize some of these components so h3 is a uh, header of size 3 in HTML, you have H1, H2, H3, H4, H5. And these are all different sizes of header, um, header text. And it just says, this is a header, and it's whatever H3 is set to. And within that, you just pop uh, the, uh, the header title that you want in there. Then separating our components using a comma after the h3 we then can define what we want next and in this instance as we're just looking at the layout just put some text in and p stands for paragraph and again standard html component um, names and so this is p for paragraph and that takes a longer section of text and uses the, um, the, the font and font size for the paragraph type. So then we finished defining what we want in our sidebar panel. And we close the brackets linked to sidebar panel and put a comma after it. We're still within the sidebar layout, but we finished defining our sidebar panel. Now we're going to work on the main panel and defining the main panel, what's going to be there. And in the main panel, we just put main panel, open our brackets. And again, we used H3 as the header to say main, the main panel and P um, and just a bit of text there. Then we go through and close our brackets for our main panel close our brackets for our sidebar layout, encapsulating the sidebar panel and main panel, and close the fluid page brackets, finishing our UI layout. Down below this, you've then got the, I mentioned that we need our server, so our functionality, and we've got server, and to that we assign, we use function, and then say input and output. And these are, we're saying this is the functionality that I want, and it's going to take the inputs and return the outputs. And those, when we go on to looking at the functionality in a minute, will be in curly brackets. But at the moment, we're not going to have any functionality, we're just looking at the layout. And then to be able to run the app, we need this run line, which is shiny app with a capital A. And our UI equals UI, comma, server equals server. And so this means that we've got our UI attributed and our server attributed to the app run command. And if I take this line out, let's just see if it changes. No, it's because. Um, so up here in the top, you can see that the normal run button has changed to run app. So that's um, actually recognized that this is a shiny app. And so we can just click on run app. Cool. Just make sure it's saved. And it builds your app for you. Uh, oh, I just maximize that. We can see that we've got our title panel up here, my first web app. And then we've got this side panel layout where we have a panel on this side here, it's on the left-hand side, not the right-hand side, 
left hand side and a um, and our text our header text that we put in and the paragraph text then on the main panel we've got the header and the paragraph text in there and if as you saw if I change that this is where the fluid page comes in because it's gone oh it might not be the page isn't really wide enough to take the side panel and the main panel next to each other I'll put them on top of each other so that's why we're using a fluid page so that is running your first web app and we can open this in the browser and I'll just show you Ooh. yeah it uh, this is what the display would look like on the internet so that is your first first shiny app they can be that simple they are um, designed to run without lots of um, complex backwards and forwards calls um, between different components and lots of styling. Normally when you're doing web development, you have to define all the different font types and where everything sits, um, the width of everything. It's, it's much more involved. Shiny does all that for you but you can mess about with that as well in the background and change that. So that's the basic layout. Let's go on to looking at a slightly more advanced layout, which is using tabs. Tabs are a really convenient way to be able to organize things in an app. Um, it, Make, it means that you don't have to shift between different pages and create different pages for each thing. You can just use tabs to be able to display different things at different times. And in here, the, um, the function for tabs is that we have a tab set panel. So this is uh, what we first initiate in the layout and we can put it either in the sidebar panel or in the main panel and then we have tab panels which are the individual tabs and they're added within the tab set panel container and within each tab panel then you then add all the components that you want displayed within the given tab so let's have a look at the tab set basic example to see how this is implemented because there is a more advanced example as well but let's start with the let's start with the basic example so as before, we have our fluid page defined, then a title panel, and this time I just changed the title to tab sets. We then say that we want a sidebar layout again, and our sidebar panel is exactly the same as for the layout example, just the header and the paragraph text. Then in the main panel, instead of just defining some uh, header and some text, put the tab set panel. And this is of type tabs. And there are a few different types because you can have button variants. And uh, there's a couple of different styling options with it, um, uh, like a nav bar, more like a nav bar. But just for this example, we're using tabs. And then after we define the type, we can then define our tab panels within the tab set panel. So here I've defined three tab panels. We put the name, first of all, of the that goes at the top of the tab, saying what the tab is. So here I've got plot, summary, 
and table. So kind of splitting out different components of uh, different things that I'd want displayed. And then afterwards, I define the components that I'd like within that tab panel. So I've just put some text in as the com so a paragraph component. And these just each one has a bit of text. And if you wanted to add more components, you'd just put a comma and add another component and then comma another component within the tab panel itself. So we can run this app as well. And now we see we still got our title sidebar panel. And this time we've got our tabs up here instead. And they're styled so that when you hover over them, you get this background showing where you are. And we can click on them and they change between the different tabs, changing what is displayed as the output. So just pause there and just see if there are any questions at the moment. No, excellent. I'll, uh, we shall push on then and we will next look at building in some functionality. So it's great if we can get these tabs, we can put different components in as we've seen, but now we need some components that can do something and give them some, um, some functionality. So, as mentioned, it's in the server section that we define our inputs and outputs. And this is a generic template for how this works, that we have Within the, our curly brackets here, this is where we're defining our, uh, our functionality. And for each bit of functionality, we need to define either an output component that it's going to be passed to or a function name if we're using reactive functions. Ooh. When we're passing something to an output component, we are assigning to it something that's being rendered. So it's a render type. And we'll look at these in a moment. But our render type is essentially a plot or some text. Um, they're the main two types that you'll be using. And that render type is what comes first before we define any of the R code that's going to be rendered and pushed to the output component. So we put our render type, then a bracket, then curly braces, and our R code is contained within these curly brackets. This is a bit different. The syntax here is different to what you use with um, normal R programming and working with functions. But the only real difference here is that we've got to contain our R code within curly braces. And we'd write in our expression um, that will be passed uh, using an input component value that'll then be passed to our output component. And then we get what are called reactive functions as well. And these are essentially the same as user defined functions. Um, so there are our own functions to do something before passing it to, um, to our uh, render and output components. And so these reactive functions can be used within our render type um, and our normal, uh, our output functions. So 
let's have a look at this in practice. So what we're going to do is define the use of the input of input components to produce some outputs. And then we're going to pass uh, these to the output components. And basically, what we're going to do is, um, oh yeah, hang on, sorry. So in the layout, what we need to be doing is adding to our layout an output component. So a container that's going to take our output. And for example, plot output here, this is the one that we're going to use. This is the output container of a specific type and we give it a unique ID. And this is how um, web, all web apps function, is that you attribute unique IDs to particular components, and that allows them to be identified and used by other components. So it's all about this use of unique IDs, and we'll see that in practice. Within the functionality section, so um, they're passing the inputs and the outputs um, of the components, sorry. Um, when we reference an output component, we use the syntax outputs, the dollar sign, and then the component ID. This is where the unique ID comes in. So it's output, any, anything that we want to pass to an output component, we use output dollar sign and the unique ID. And that defines the object to pass the output to. We also mentioned about using rendering, that we needed a, uh, to pass in a render type to say what we wanted to render. And these, these again, they use simple names. And in this instance, it's render plot because we're going to output a plot. So we use render plot with a capital P and all outputs require some render type. Within the render function, we've got our R expression, which is wrapped in curly braces. And any input that we want to use for that output Again, uses a similar sense or uses the same syntax as the output component. When we're defining that, we say we want our input dollar sign and the unique component ID. And that defines the object from which you get the value. So let's have a look at that in practice. So if you go to the functionality example, We'll talk through this. So <clears throat> what we've got here, we've got our UI, our user interface, our layout definition. We're again using fluid page. Got our title panel, my first web app, comma. And then we're defining our, lay um, our layout for the rest of the page, our sidebar layout and a side panel. And we got our H3, our header component. We then got some text in the paragraph component. And this time I've added in a slider input. So all of these different components that you commonly see in dashboards and in web interfaces, these are all pre-built into, uh, into Shiny. So, and they all have different um, calls to them. And for a slider input, we use slider input. And we open the brackets and the first argument, the first argument for any input or output objects is always the unique ID. And so what I've called this one is just OBS, standing for observations. And then within the slider input, it takes a few different, it takes a number of different arguments, but the ones we're going to use here are a piece of text, 
to display with the slider, saying number of observations. We're then going to set the, the minimum value of the slider, the maximum value, and the value that it starts off at. And all of these um, different arguments are all com contained within the Shiny documentation. When you, if you're building Shiny apps, you will need to have the Shiny documentation open to be able to know exactly which arguments you need to be completing for each object that you're using. And there are a lot of objects, and until you get really familiar with it, you will need that documentation open. And then we finish our slider input, and we finish our slider uh, sidebar layout. Then we go on and define our main panel. Again, got our header object, our text object, and this time we're defining an output object as well. So here we're using a plot output, and its unique ID is dist plot. And that's all the arguments that we need to provide to the plot output at this time. And so that completes our UI our, our, and our layout. And so next we can go on to determine the functionality. So as you can see, this isn't very complicated, this line. We're saying we've got our server, the functionality that we're going to define, and our function is going to uh, take inputs and pass out outputs. And we wrap this in curly braces. And then we define our first output. And we're going to output, we use the dollar sign, and the unique ID of the object of which we're going to output. So output, dollar sign, disk plot. And that's using the unique ID of our plot output object. And to that, we're going to assign, we're going to assign a plot and we use render plot so that we've got our render object saying, this is a plot I want you to output. So use normal bracket curve brackets. And then we need to put our, our, our R code in curly brackets. And here we're just simply using hist, which if you recall the ba in, uh, basic R session, this is the uh, base R plot for um, a histogram. And within that, we're going to use R norm, which is drawing data, uh, drawing random numbers from the normal distribution. And we're going to choose, all that we need to choose is how many uh, observations we want, how many, um, how many data points do we want to sample from the normal distribution. And we're going to do that by bringing in a value from our slider. And that will tell us how many and how many observations we want. So we use input dollar sign obs, obs being the unique name of our slider input. And that's it. We close all our brackets. And if we run this app, you'll then see we get our side panel. We've got our slider here with our text saying number of observations and this very nicely formatted slider bar with our minimum of zero and our maximum of 1000 and our starting value of 500. We then get a histogram produced over here as our output object in our main panel. And this is 500 observations drawn from the random, uh, randomly drawn from the normal distribution and presented as a histogram. Just to say, um, when you draw randomly from the normal distribution in R, it uses a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, which is why you see the shape. Uh, of the distribution as it is 
and that it's centered on zero. So we can then grab the slider and change it. 250 observations, 798 observations. And that, those simple few lines of code allow you to create what is fairly complex uh, web interaction of being able to take an input and pass it to another uh, to a, a piece of code to do something with and then present you with an output. OK, I'm just going to pause there a moment. Have you got any questions at the moment? No? OK, excellent. Right, so that is how um, shiny functionality works in R. That is, that's it. That is the extent. If you can do that for all the different components, and yeah, getting some of their arguments right and making sure your data goes in the right way is the challenge of it. But that is the standard um, template for creating inputs and outputs in uh, Shiny. It's all there is to it. Except from <laughs> reactive functions, which are really handy. But these are like user-defined functions. And they're just used within the app functionality, within the server um, call. And yeah, they are, they are the same. They act the same way as user-defined functions. And they allow us to do to define a function within the functionality server definition and then use that multiple times because we don't want to keep rewriting our code we can def if we want if we have a function that we want used multiple times just write it once and then we can use it within different output component calls <clears throat> so we give it a name, and uh, in this instance, we're going to call our uh, reactive function disk, desk, which is distribution description. I should pick a names that are easier to say, um, but that's our uh, our function name. Then we're also within this uh, app going to render some text, and because we're going to render uh, the uh, some descriptive statistics of our distribution. And the render text call is just render text with a capital T. And the reactive function that we define is going to be called from within another function. So let's have a look at how that works. This is just extending what we've just done just a little bit further. So reactive example and within, so this code is within the reactive example. And let's just go through this. We've got exactly the same um, layout as we had in the uh, functionality example. Title panel, sidebar layout, sidebar panel some uh, header and some text, our slider input, that's still exactly the same with the same unique ID. We've then got our main panel, main panel header, text, and this time we've got the plot output, and then we've also got a text output. And this time the unique ID for the text output is dist text. Okay. <clears throat> So when we come down to our server functionality here, so again, we've got assign it to server function, taking the inputs and producing outputs. And then first of all, we're going to define our reactive function. 
So the function is called disk desk, and that's the name. And to, to this function name, we're going to assign reactive. So this is say stating that we're going to have, this is a reactive function. So instead of a render, we're saying this is a reactive function. Open our cur curve brackets and open our curly brackets because we've still got to make sure that any of our R code is within curly brackets. I'm then using the paste zero function, which is where a function that allows you to concatenate uh, text together to produce a longer different bits um, to be able to um, produce a longer text string, just sticking them together. So using paste zero, and within that function, using the text string you have selected, and then we're going to bring in the input uh, as our input the number of observations. So in the same way that we're using it, the um, obs uh, our uh, slider input number to produce the histogram. We're also using it here just as uh, as a number and putting it into a text string. And so you have selected a number of observations to plot and then close our brackets there. And then the next line is that we've got our first output and our output to disk plot and we're going to render the plot, and this is the same as before, the histogram drawn from the random normal distribution using the number of observations defined by the slider input. And in addition, we're going to output some text. We're going to output this text um, to our dist text object here. And so we define outputs, dollar sign, dist text, and assign to that, we use render text as our render type, and then open curve brackets, open curly brackets, and we call the function disk desk, and making sure to complete it with, because it's a function with uh, curved brackets. And so here we're just calling the function disk desk that we've defined here as a reactive function. And that's it, we close all our brackets. And when we run the app, you can then see we've got the same as before, except from now we have this piece of text underneath, under the uh, histogram saying you have selected 500 observations to plot. Remove the slider. It then says you have selected 212 observations to plot. 719 observations to plot. 959. And in this way, so the term reactive is merely saying that it's a function that will be updated every time something changes that the input changes in the app and it will update itself and produce a new um, and rerun and rerun. So does that functionality make sense in terms of having your render calls and the reactive functions in order to be able to do things time and time again. Because we could, in, the, in this example, we could have just put this uh, code paste and the string and the input directly into our render text function here. But one, it's an example of how to use a reactive function 
but also we might want to use this text somewhere else and pass it to another output. So all we'd have to do is call disk desk as the function and output it onto one of the other tabs. Okay. Right. Importing data. This is uh, obviously a really important thing. Quite often, um, it won't just be one data set that you want to use for the tool. You want to be able to import your own data. And there's a component for that. And this is file input. And that's file input component. And this is used to import data nice and easily. Again, requires a unique ID and also a label um, to say a label set to say what's happening. Um, and it can be set to accept only certain file types. So it means that it will throw an error back to the user if they try to uh, upload a, uh, an incorrect file type to it. It's useful to, to constrain your upload in that way could because it stops the whole thing from crashing if an incorrect file type is uploaded. The file input requires a reactive function to read in the data. And we'll see again, it's something once you've written it once, you can use it again and again and again, or you can use my example again and again and again. Um, and has the uh, the syntax of the um, yeah the code for it is that it should start with request this R E Q call saying request and it requests from the input component from our file input component saying go to it and get something from it. And so then we need to then read in the data using the correct read function. So I, as a general rule, always use CSVs when re reading in data. But if you do want to use XLS um, Excel files, then you'd need to make sure you use um, read.xls rather than read.csv. And then we return from the function the data in the required format. And then within this um, example, we're going to have a table output, which is a component used to display the data. It displays it as a table. And render table function to render the table. So it's nice, they're quite uh, obvious names, um, I hope. and. Uh, it means there's quite a few of them, but it's, you know, this render plot, render text, render table. They're fairly memorable. Okay. Yep. Let's have a look at the import example then. So, okay, so this is within your um, R Shiny folder. You will have a folder called import example. And then within the import example folder, you've got the app.r file and some example data. And in fact, I think this is the data from the, oh no, no, this is, uh, yeah, it might be the log normal data. <laughs> so this time oh, we've got a slightly different setup for our, uh, for our layout. We start again with our UI assignment and pass to that, first of all, the fluid page. And within that, we've got a title panel and I've called this import data example, comma. And then we define our sidebar layout. And in the sidebar pane, uh, in the sidebar panel, we're going to put 
the file input object so that this appears on the side in our side uh, sidebar panel. And we're going to give it the unique ID of upload and then the label upload file. And here, this is um, the statement where you can set the uh, accepted file types. So I've put here for it to accept only a CSV. And these are three different ways of defining a CSV. And then close our file input brackets, close our sidebar, uh, sidebar panel brackets, and go on to defining the main panel, which is going to contain just uh, the table output. So we've got our table output function here, and the unique ID being assigned to that is data table. Okay. Now, we move down to the functionality. And again, this is kind of how, how if you're uploading CSVs, um, you'd be doing the same thing and use the same bit of code over and over again, or very similar piece of code, minor changes. So we're setting up a new function within, so within our server input output, and I'm going to call this function my data. And this is going to be a reactive function. Open our curved brackets, open our curly braces. And first line, as I said, is going to be the request. Is it a request or require? Um, but it's saying, I need. And it's requesting input. Um, so we're calling, we're saying, I need an input dollar sign and I want it from the object called upload. So it's going and saying I want whatever this file input thing upload has got, this input object has got, give it to me. And then it's going to um, then what we need to do is actually read in the data. And what we're going to do is we're going to assign it to the variable df, so data frame. And because it's a CSV, we read it in using the read.csv function. And we need to say where it's coming from. And we need to say inputs. We're, we're getting an input, dollar sign, upload. So we're taking it from the upload object, the object with the unique ID upload. And then there's a second dollar sign and with the words data path. And what that's doing is grabbing the path, the file path, to where the data has been temporarily stored. And so what has happened is that the file input object has read in the data and it's temporarily stored it in a particular location known only to itself. <laughs> but that's accessed by calling data path. And that, so it's like your, um, uh, your file path uh, for, for any of your files. It's exactly the same principle. It's just finding that and going, get it from here. So that reads in the CSV. And then what I've done is just um, taken DF and taken all rows and column one and returned that as uh, the data. So that just ends up, this is just a little bit of um, 
data cleaning just to get this as a vector of data that I wanted. And uh, it doesn't upload any index numbers. And then in a similar way to um, user-defined functions here, we're going to specify to return data. And in the previous reactive um, function that we wrote, we didn't put a return statement. That was because there was only one output or only th one thing being assigned within the function. Here, we've got df and data. So we need to tell the function that I want to return data, not df, um, and just be explicit about that. And this is a slightly funny uh, nuance with Shiny, that within reactive functions, if there's only one thing being um, uh, being assigned within a function, it will automatically return that, and you don't need a return statement. But it's generally good practice to put a return statement in. And so that's going to return our data from the reactive function called my data. And we then run that function. That will be output. Um, uh, we want to send it to the uh, output data table because we want to render this as a table. So we use render table. And we just call the function my data. And, and that'll go in, run this request, the um, will require the uh, input upload, um, the input from the upload object, and then it will go in and read the CSV and, and return our data. So we can go in and run this app. And now we've got a header import data example. And our side panel here with upload file, our label within our upload object, and it's got a nice browse button. This will open your um, file explorer, and it's opened in the location that, uh, that I want, uh, where I've got the app. So thankfully, the data's there as well, but you can navigate about as much as you want, obviously. And I'm just going to sample data, automatically uploads the data. And now it's output my data as a table here with all the observations drawn there. So that's how you can read in data using uh, shiny, the Shiny um, file input component. Uh, any questions on importing data? Okay. Excellent. We're uh, we're getting through this nicely. So, inputs. Um, when we're talking about so in this context, talking about inputs, these are um, all the different types of input objects that you can get. Uh, so not the file input per se. Um, that's one type of input object. Um, but if you've got um, number uh, input boxes that take uh, a number or a text string, um, they'll produce single values. And these and single values being produced by an object, um, by an input object, can be of the type. They can be strings. They can be boolean. They can be integers, double. Um, so float num floating point numbers, um, and these single values they can be evaluated directly. And this means that basically you can use them, and they'll just they don't need any kind of pre-processing. They will be um, 
brought in as the uh, type, the number, uh, the, uh, oh, <laughs> the object type that it's defined as. So when you're using input boxes, they will be, you'll you can set them as either to take numbers or to take strings, which is a, a useful thing. So it automatically says this is going to be a number and, can, and we'll throw an error if it isn't a number. But then also we get, uh, for example, the, uh, the input that we read in was a vector of data, uh, so a column of data. And these produce, this is essentially a list of values. Or for example, range sliders are a good one, where you set an, a lower bound and upper bound, so this gives you two values. And that will be, uh, that produces a list of the two values. And again, they can be strings or booleans, integers, floating point numbers, double um, accuracy numbers but they'll need to be evaluated iteratively. So you need to run them through a loop to make sure that you pick out, work through each element in the list, um, or to say, I want specifically uh, the value at index one or the value at index two, um, and make sure that you're thinking about the format in which your data or the uh yeah the data is being produced or coming in or going out okay um just a quick one um a little bit of a oh light relief we'll talk about app deployment um <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier, these apps can be, uh, Shiny apps can be deployed um, either from within R or as standalone web pages, but also more recently as um, standalone executables, which uh, I'll, I'll put some information up about that. Um, but you can launch them from within R and uh, host the files at a web address. You can run them um, on, uh, host the files on GitHub, and they can be run directly out of GitHub. Uh, Git Gist is a pasteboard service, not something that I've come across, um, operated by GitHub that doesn't require a sign up. So it's essentially, a, um, again, another way of just being able to host the files so that anybody can access them. Uh, you can use uh, shinyapps.io. Uh, there are free and paid options for this, and it's a very simple way to be able to host your app as a standalone web page. You can use Shiny Server, which again is free and paid options, but that requires a Linux server. And um, Shiny Proxy, which is similar. Um, similar to Shiny Server, but free and provides enterprise level functionality. I haven't tried any of these, um, I must say. It's, uh, these are the, um, the options for deployment that I was able to find. Um, and again, there's lots of information online about how to do the deployment using these. Um, it's having a little experiment and seeing what works best for you. Um, I mean, it might just be you just want to pop your code on GitHub and uh, let people be able to use it that way. That I would recommend as one of the best ways to uh, just share the app initially. Um, saves having to pay for hosting because what a lot of these things rely on is you having server space or having a web address, um, which you have to pay for the domain name um, for the hosting. So. Um, they are fully deploy deployable, but it costs a little bit, a little bit of money. You can do limited deployment um, on your own uh, GitHub and uh, GitLab, and that they're uh, set up to run Shiny apps now. And yeah, you can uh, I assume that Git Gist is, uh, or sorry, run, um, yeah, run GitHub 
will run it directly from GitHub and get gist must be similar. Yeah, something to have a play with anyway. So let's um, I'm just going to stop there and just say um, Right, any questions? I've just seen, got, got a question here from uh, Heather just saying, what would it look like if you were taking it from an SQL table? Uh, uh, so, personally, I don't work with SQL inputs. Your, as, as far as I'm aware, SQL inputs would be, have to be formatted as a data frame anyway when it's brought into R. So you will be up there, it is, and people do, I've heard people talking of examples, they do pipeline from SQL, um, access from a database, in pipe it into um, the Shiny app, uh, whether automatically with regular updates um, or on a button click. Um, you will likely need a transformation to a data frame at that point. And knowing that uh, the R SQL integration is really quite good now, um, there should be plenty of examples of that. But it will just display, well, it will bring your data in as a data frame, then it's up to you to do what you want with that and display it how you want it displayed. Thank you. No problem. Um, right. I get that that was probably quite a lot of information about Shiny. Um, I think it would be good just to take a, a quick five minute pause. And then what I do is introduce the um, exercise that I'd like you to have a go at in groups. I'll put you into breakout rooms, um, just splitting you up into groups, because we're gonna, you're gonna build a shiny app now, um, and yeah, I think it'll be good for everybody to work together, and it's gonna be building on the distribution fitting work that we did earlier. So again, lots of, I hope there'll be good conversation around that and get everybody working together. So if we just um, come back in in a few minutes um, at quarter two and I'll explain the task and then you can um, work over the next, uh, the following hour um, and develop an app. And we can come back at the end and have a little discussion about that. So um, just take five minutes just to have a quick stretch. Okay, so the exercise today, this is going to hopefully wrap together everything that we've talked about today. Plus with a GG plot, working with uh, fit dist R plus and uh, doing distribution fitting and then building shiny apps. So as we mentioned, when we were looking at the distribution fitting, it's something you have to do in pretty much all modeling that we need to be able to fit distributions and particularly anybody doing a DES project. Distribution fitting is, is incredibly important to be able to do it um, competently and to be able to justify the process by which you fitted your distributions. It also allows for transparency in your models because you can share the distributions that you've used much easier than you can the raw data. Um, and yeah, being able to uh, have code that you use to automate the, or to help automate the uh, fitting of distributions is much easier than trying to write it from scratch every time. So the aim, that, so the task um, is uh, to build an app to help you fit name distributions to your data. Um, 
And I promise you really do only need to use the functionality that we've learned today and little bits from the getting to grips with uh, our session that we did previously. The, so the aim to build an app to automate the distribution fitting process. And I've kind of put in some specifications here to help you think through all the different components that, uh, or the different components that you need in there. So you want to have the ability to import data um, so that you can bring in whichever data sets you want. You want the ability to display the raw data so you can see the actual data itself and go through and check the data. Um, want to be able to plot the data as a histogram using ggplot2. Be able to uh, plot the empirical density and cumulative distribution and the color and uh, Cullen and Frey graph. Remember those for being able to look at the data and uh, look at the sh uh, estimate the shape and um, get an idea of that. So um, that's the first thing that you'll need to do with the data. And also print out the Cullen and Frey summary statistics along with that. Then fit multiple named distributions to the data. And I'd recommend being able to select the um, named distributions. So you'll want some kind of input uh, where you can select from different distribution named distributions. That does require a function, uh, a, an input component that we haven't looked at. Um, but I'm pretty sure with a little bit of thinking and a little bit of looking, you'll be able to uh, work out which one that uh, would be suitable for that. Uh, and then you also want to be able to plot the density, cumulative density, QQ and PP plots of the fitted distributions and print um, fitting summaries, goodness of fit statistics and uncertainty, uncertainty statistics. Um, if I go to the next slide, here we've got some shiny resources. Uh, there's some useful tutorials here at masteringshiny.org. There is, is also the link to all of the function reference materials. You will need this. Um, and if I just open this here, so this gives you all of the different possibilities, all the different possible functions that you can use for the UI, the user interface layout, for the user interface inputs. So these are things like uh, text inputs, like password inputs, radio buttons, numeric inputs, all of these different uh, options there for you. All of the different outputs that you can have so um, here we have, you know, plot output, a table output, you can have a data table output, text output, verbatim text output. Um, and uh, things, so for the interface building, we were using H3, for example, as the header, and P, you've got these different HTML builder functions in here, uh, just so if you want to um, play about with headers and things like that. Um, the rendering functions are all listed here. Reactive programming, um, and it, it keeps keeps going. You don't, you won't need a lot of the rest of it, uh, <laughs> I promise you. But this this is this is the shiny bible. This is what you need to know. And you just click on any of these and it gives you the full explanation of that, uh, of that function. So yeah, we've got uh, plot output and you, all the different arguments that you can set, you don't have to set, but you can set and um, anything that you want to uh, be able to play about with that um, in kind of standard API. Um, and so just going to things like um, checkbox input. So things 
uh, different inputs. You got uh, tells you here in red things that it needs that you have to have, and the blank black ones are the black arguments are um, optional. So you need a unique ID, you need a label, um, and again it tells you what should be input as the arguments. The description of what uh, this object does. Um, the value um, and the server value, importantly, that's output. So, um, for example, here for a checkbox input control, so uh, checkbox that you click, if it's ticked, it returns true, otherwise, it returns false. So, that's a single value single boolean value that's being returned for you so little things like that all this information is here in the documentation for you okay so the link for that is here in the slide deck so if you've got the slides and you've got the link um it's also information on deploying shiny but that's that you can look at as for another time um other than that, yeah, have a go. And we'll come back at four o'clock and we'll see what you've managed to do. Oh, before I do forget, actually, that would be silly of me. So I understand this is a difficult task. So I have <laughs> kindly, maybe kindly, um, given you options. So you'll find in the um, in the R Shiny folder, there's a folder called Exercise Templates, and these range from easy to very hard. And let me just I'll, I'll just show you each of the templates that we've got. So. The very hard template is oh, that to open that. So the very hard template that that is just a blank script. Yeah, um, write it from scratch. That's the very hard option for you. Um, I. I I'd like to see somebody have a go. That would be that would be great. Um, the hard template. Well, I haven't given you that much, really, to be honest. <laughs> given given you the uh, the imports and uh, the base, very 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 basic layout. The medium template gives you. What I've used in uh, my um, worked example, I have built this, so uh, I, I have a version of it. Um, and so it gives you an outline to work to. Um, so you might choose to use that. And the easy version has much more in it in terms of the arguments but the main thing that i've taken out is the um, labels and the unique ids um, and there are other missing bits of information um, inputs for the uh, functionality um, uh, and You'd also have to use the output names, which are used, and some of the input names, which are used in the functionality, and write them into the um, the layout. I actually think that's a bit harder <laughs> than writing it yourself, um, because you've got to go through and work out what I've deleted. Um, so, up to you whether you go with the easy or not. Um, I'd recommend having a go at the medium. Uh, first, if you're really not feeling confident, um, but go on, I'd, I'd go for the hard or the very hard. I'd, uh, 
um, use all the materials that you have. Um, obviously, if you get stuck as well, you know, start with the um, the hard template perhaps. And if you get a bit stuck, have a look at the medium. If you're still stuck, have a look at the uh, easy template. But yeah, think about how you, um, the functionality in your app's going to work. Design that first um, and then think about the different components that you need to build in, build your layout, then build your functionality in around that. Um, yeah, use the slides, use the examples um, that are there, um, use uh, the shiny documentation and have a go. So what I'm gonna do is split it into breakout rooms now. So we'll do groups of four working on this and yeah, have a go. Come back at um, four o'clock and we'll have a little bit of a wrap up and just see, see how you manage to get on. See you in a bit.